record. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Daryl. Um, uh, I'm your teacher, Daryl Moore, and um, I would hope to start the show off with a lot of panache. We've got a brand new video system that we're using, uh, and I'm not really familiar with it. So I, was, I had a lot of um, slick stuff planned, and it all seems to be going wrong. And um, rather than uh, have uh, you guys put on uh, set in, in confusion, I'm just going to give you the content and, and not try to um, make it look real um, show pro-ish. Uh, so you're just going to get a messy desktop. I'm going to move around from app to app, and I'm going to learn as I go. And uh, that's what you guys have to do yourself. Um, my name's Daryl. Uh, let me see if I can turn on uh, show the video panel. Uh, how many people have video on their computers? Um, anybody want to show it? Is this, uh, I have the ability to, let's see, run the video. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to try to just keep the video to a minimum uh, uh, for this class. This is a, a video conferencing software. But what we want to do is just run a class. I want to be able to, to tell you what's going on and, and run through things. I've got a, a PowerPoint deck that I'm going to run through, and I've got uh, the Full Sail website up on a browser, and I'm just going to run through it and show you some of the homework, some of what we're doing. and. Um, uh, you'll kind of get a backstage view rather than a front of the seat view because I'm new to the software. Uh, oddly enough, we've been using uh, different software from a different company, Cisco, for about four or five years. And we were always looking for better software. And we found something that we liked. It has a lot of great capabilities. And our contract with it, uh, our old software ended on March 28th. And so we were planning to do this new software, Zoom, that some of you are, might already be pretty familiar with. But Zoom seems to have taken off in the last two or three months, or last two or three weeks, because of the, the, the virus and everyone being shut in. So um, there are a lot of things going on with Zoom. There are a lot of capabilities. But we're not completely up to speed on it. This is the first time I'm running a show in Zoom. And so uh, I have the ability to turn on my video. Can you guys see my video? I don't know exactly even what's going out to you guys. You can hear me, you can see the desktop. All right, so my video is not on at this moment. Uh, if I were to, uh, all right, I'm hiding the video floating panel and now I'm showing the video floating panel. And so uh, here we can see that uh, as many people that are tuned in, I'm pretty much the only one that has my camera on. Now I'm not uh, delighted to have my camera on. I don't like to be on TV and I'm not real pretty. You know, you're not gonna gain a whole lot by my being on camera. I don't know why we're getting into all this stuff right now, but uh, this thing seems to be going in uh, its own, own pace. So what I'm gonna do is forget about the video. You guys don't seem to wanna to be on video. Uh, I hope you will like to talk because we wanna be having conversations back and forth. But I, I really wanna just get you settled into the system. And uh, you know, if once we get all the other kinks worked out, maybe we might start uh, running some more video. But I'm gonna hide the video panel now. And you guys don't have to worry about being on camera or being yourselves. But I do want to let you all know that uh, right now, when it shows these things, and you, everyone's going to get a display of everyone else who's there, if you don't have anything set, it just shows your name, which is a fine way of introducing yourself. But you can also take a profile image. So instead of being on video, you can have an avatar, like in the uh, FSO system. So if anybody wants to, you can go to your preferences and you can insert a, a, um, an image and that image will be there instead of the video. And for a lot of people, that's a little more comfortable. Uh, you can be represented by your own photo rather than by your own video. 
And uh, more and more as you use this software, because we're just starting to use it here at Full Sail, and we're gonna be using it from here on in, you guys will become more, more comfortable. And um, in terms of interacting with your classmates, it really is helpful to have the video on and just be talking face to face because then it feels like you're in the same space and you feel normal. And uh, talking to someone, you know, very formally or without knowing who they are or anything like that, um, you know, it, it's spooky for the first time. Once you get used to being on video, it's not a big deal. So I'm gonna hide the video panel now. If you guys uh, have control of it, you can, you can look at each other and so forth. Uh, you have access to a chat panel. So somewhere on your controls, so there's a chat panel, you can talk to each other. Uh, you can make notes to each other. You can uh, tell each other how awfully I'm doing right now. But what I wanna do is get back into just the base lecture. Uh, this week is the first week of creative presentation. And the things I want to get accomplished are just uh, get settled with everybody, talk to you about the system, talk to you about what the reading is that we've assigned for this week, and uh, talk about the two um, activities that we want you to do, a discussion and an assignment called the TED Talks Analysis. And I'm going to get into that uh, much more fully so you guys can completely know what I'm expecting of you and, and what we have to do. Uh, the way the full sales system works, each class is four weeks long. Uh, and typically, uh, each class is broken up by week. So assignments will open up at the beginning of the week, and you have all week to work on them. Since you're online students, you can make your own schedule. And what I like to do is lay everything out at, on Monday. I'm not asking you to do it all. I, I, I saw a lot of people working very hard to try to finish their TED Talks assignment today. Nothing is due until Sunday. So what I'd like you to do is just take a look on Mondays to see what you have to get done and then start to make a schedule for yourself. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are shut in right now because of the national lockdown or whatnot or, or whether it's affecting your ability to, to work or do other things, but in normal times as an online student, you guys are pretty busy. You have your families to take care of, some of you are in the military, some of you have jobs, some of you have second jobs. So finding a time for your studies is difficult. If you're in quarantine right now with nothing else to do and no job to go to, maybe you got a lot of time for studies and we can have uh, a lot of extra activities this, this week month if that's what you guys need to keep you from uh, you know, going nuts. But in the most part, you only have so much time to relate to your studies. And what I'd like you to do is get into a habit of making a plan on Mondays for what you have to do to get everything done and taking advantage, doing, not trying to get it all done in, in a jam, not working all week and then opening up book, the books on Saturday to see if you can get it done by Sunday, you know, in a, in a huff, but doing a, a little bit every day, making it a regular pattern so that it just becomes a normal thing, normal part of your work week, your work day to be doing studying and that you protect that study space. There's so much of life that's gonna impinge on you. You know, your kids are gonna get sick. You're gonna, you're gonna have uh, to work extra shifts. You know, uh, hurricanes will come or tornadoes or whatever crazy weather or crazy viruses happen. And your schedule is gonna get shifted. And so protecting your study schedule as a student is a very important thing to do. And in order to protect it, you've gotta create it as a habit. And so as a brand new student, you're in a very tough position of starting a brand new habit. Uh, and so the best way to go about this is just to think about what you have to get done and start to figure out you know, a schedule for yourself, doing a little bit each day. So I mentioned the software Zoom that we're just starting and it's got a lot of great capabilities. Uh, if we wanna have face-to-face -face video conferencing, we can have everyone turn on their video cams and we can all talk to each other. I can, I can control the audio. So we can say hello and, and uh, um, uh, I can let everybody talk at once. There's not so many people here today that you know turning on all the mics is gonna create cacophony. Sometimes I'll have classes with 30 or 40 people in them and then it becomes impossible for me to have all the mics on all the time. But um, I am also recording this. So another thing that I like to do is just to make sure that the audio doesn't get too flooded up with too many uh, audio inputs. 
uh, too much ambient noise starts to build a little, you know, hiss in the in the background. It makes the record the audio recording muddy. And so if you're not able to make the class the live session on a on a particular time, and I've chosen Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern time, which you know, if you're in another time zone, means that, it, you know, you have to make allowances for that. If you're in mountain time, that's uh, uh, three o'clock. And uh, if you're in uh, uh, Pacific, you're, that's two o'clock. So um, it may or may not be convenient for you to come to, to the live session. If you can't, always know that there'll be a recording that you can watch and it'll get posted shortly after the live session. And uh, you can watch that throughout the whole week. It also eliminates the need for you to really take hard notes. If it helps you to take notes, then I don't want to talk you out of it. But if taking notes is something you do out of fear, then just relax and listen and let whatever you can soak in, knowing that if you have to hear something over again, you can go back to the video and just watch it over again as many times as you need. So especially when I start going into the homework, and how you have to do it and what the processes are. Uh, you know, don't feel you have to write all that stuff down because you, you do have access to, to it through, through the video. Now, with Zoom, we have a couple of channels open to us. You guys can write in the, uh, the chat box. And uh, let's go down to the chat box right now. One of the things I'd like to see is just where we are represented. We've got students from all over the country. We've got students from all different degrees. Uh, if you could, go to the chat box right now and just type where you're at right now, whether you're in your hometown or not, but uh, whatever your location you're, you're listening from right now, and we'll see what part of the country we have uh, represented. Sherman, Tampa, Florida, Charlotte, New Jersey, Northern New York, Santa Rosa, Oaks, California, Wisconsin, hey, Wisconsin. Uh, all right, so we have a, a pretty good roundup of the United States, the West Coast, East Coast, a little bit of the Midwest. So, um, this software is going to give us capabilities and we're just starting to use them and uh, I was hoping to be putting on a very fancy show where you weren't really seeing the, the programs I wasn't running and and I was controlling the video but it, I'm not quite there yet we're, we're, we're up and new and uh, so I'm just gonna let you see all the the warts and, and uh, whatnot I'm a I'm somebody who really just wants to to be helpful I don't have to be really fancy or show off or anything like that but Zoom is software that I think you're going to end up being very familiar with. It's going to be part of every class you have from going from now on. It's probably going to be ubiquitous out in the outer world as well. I have already gone to a number of birthday parties through Zoom with my cousins and, and uh, aunts and uncles because of the quarantine virusing. So Zoom is probably going to be something that takes over Skype um, and just becomes something everybody knows how to use and, and if that's the case, then that's a good thing because we don't want exotic tools. We want familiar tools. Uh, it's, always easy, it's always best to use the simplest thing to get something accomplished. You know, you don't want to use complicated software for its own sake. Uh, you guys are coming here to school to learn really uh, complicated software, you know, 3D Maya, uh, um, uh, audio production software. Final Cut Pro, these are not things you learn in a day, but they are programs that are complicated because they do complicated things. And in this month and in the first couple of months you're here, uh, because you don't have your lap, your launch box or anything like that, you're gonna have assignments that are generally uh, not calling for high-end tools. You know, uh, we're providing you with Microsoft Works, which gives you Word and PowerPoint. Uh, those tools should be all you need to get most things accomplished. If you don't use, want to use Microsoft wor uh, Works, um, uh, there are plenty of other equally uh, valid tools out there to, to do the same thing. Uh, Google Docs and, and, and so forth. So Zoom is just something you're going to become familiar with. We're going to use it more and more. And I'm going to try in just a minute to see if we can even use the, uh, the audio functions here. So um, I already told you my name. My name is Daryl Moore, and uh, this is what I look like. You can see the video as well. But 
Uh, you can see I'm kind of an old guy. I'm not young and hip anymore. I've been teaching an awful long time. And before that, I was in the video field. Uh, I wrote a lot of books on video. Then I produced programs for uh, uh, home video market in the 80s. And then I got involved in using computers to do video work at an early stage when it first became available. Uh, because in the 80s, when I was producing video, it was just so expensive to go into the studio and get effects done. And I thought, God, it's got to be cheaper than $30,000 to get that done. And when Mac computers started to be able to do that for the price of rendering for a day and a half, I wanted to know how to do that very quickly. And so I very quickly became uh, involved in new video software. I, I, I was one of the first beta testers of After Effects in the early 90s, and I was using other video uh, tools on computers, and I started teaching that. And that's how I got into teaching uh, from, from uh, um, using computer graphics on computers for video work. And eventually I got involved in online education and I've been teaching here at Full Sail for the last 13 to 14 years. They called me in to teach digital video for about 10 or 12 years. And for the last three or four years, I've been teaching creative presentation. And it's not that big a change. Um, video is about storytelling. And this class is about storytelling. You're going to learn that the main thing that's important in this class is not the technical tools that you use, but your own thoughts and organizing them and expressing them in ways that other people can uh, receive them the way you want it to. So uh, I'm a kind of an old guy. I'm not hip anymore. If I make musical references, it'll be to old bands like the Rolling Stones or the Roxy Music or the Talking Heads. Um, but um, I do know computers and I am very, very um, interested in helping students. So I make myself very available. You can get a hold of me any way you like. I've given you my phone number. Uh, that's primarily so you can text me whenever you want. But if you want to call me, that's fine too. I'm happy to take phone calls. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to take email. Uh, and you can, you can message me on the FSO system. So I'm always around and I'm always looking uh, to see where messages are. If you feel like you need a really quick answer, texting is the easiest way to get to me. I always have my phone with me. And uh, if you send me a text, you're very likely to get an answer back almost instantaneously. If you send me a message on the FSO system, you can expect to get an answer back in a half hour to an hour, uh, which is pretty quick for an asynchronous system like that. But the main point is that uh, I'm usually around and I'm usually happy to help. And I have published office hours, but um, really you can think about trying to get a hold of me whenever you like. And one of the things I'm gonna try this month is using this new software here, uh, Zoom, to have video office hours. So for an hour a day, I'm gonna publish a time when you can just drop in and we can have video chat and we can talk about anything you want. And that'll just be open-ended. And again, it's for answering your questions, nothing for me uh, to, to trying to get accomplished. It's just, I'll be available. So um, that's who I am. Now I'd like to try to find out who some of you guys are. So again, there's not so many of you. We can, we can try to go through this. Uh, I'm gonna call on you guys. And when I call on you, I'm gonna unmute your mic. And when I unmute your mic, you've got 15 seconds to answer four questions. So this is your first chance to make a, a creative presentation. Now, this isn't a gotcha. This isn't, you know, the questions aren't, you know, what is E M equals MC squared? I'm gonna tell you the four questions right now. I want you to tell me, what is your name? Where are you from? What are you here studying? Because you guys are all mixed together. You're, you're all different degree programs put together. That's what the first couple of months classes are like. So I want you to tell me which degree program you're here for. And then finally, give me two words that describe your professional vision. So little mini Rorschach, just think about words that describe yourself and, and, and give me a title. Now, if your microphone isn't working or you don't want to uh, speak out loud, then you can say pass in the chat box. But I'm just gonna go down my list and unmute the mics and see what we got here. First up, and if I mangle your name, please correct me. I hate it when pe I mess people's names up, but if you tell me once, I'll remember forever. Uh, Alexander Miles, are you there? Yes. How you doing? 
Uh, I'm doing good. How are you? Pretty good. You ready to go? My name is Alexander Miles. I'm from Duluth, Georgia, Atlanta, and I'm studying for the creative writing program and a bachelor's degree. Excellent. Two words to describe me would be uh, experimental and curious. Excellent. Okay. Way to, way to go, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chaz Mulkey. Oh, hold on. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. My name is Chaz Mulkey. I'm from Temple, Florida, and I'm studying in an audio production class. Um, two words that would describe me would be um, eager to learn. I like, you know, to learn new stuff. And mm, I don't know about the last one. Well, we'll let eager be the second word. All right. Good one, too. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Douglas Hodo. Hello. Hi, you there? Yes, I'm here. My name Douglas Hodo. I'm from Atlanta, George. Studying audio production. Two words about me. Um, energetic and um, creative. There you go. Thank you. Right. Evan Whiteley. Am I gone? Yes. Okay, I'm Evan Whiteley. Um, I live in Los Angeles. California and Sherman Oaks, and I'm studying audio production, the bachelor's degree program, and two words that describe my vision is vivid and grandiose. Ah, maestro. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly McCall. Um, my name is Kimberly McCall. Um, I am enrolled in the bachelor's degree in graphic design. Um, two words to describe myself is artistic and creative. Excellent. Thank you, Kimberly. Kyle McCullen. Yeah, my name is Kyle McMullen. I am from uh, Santa Rosa, California. I'm studi studying for my bachelor's in audio production. And I would say I am efficient and straightforward. Excellent. Uh, Kimberly McCall. Oh, I already went. I don't. Uh, I don't yeah, that's my fault. I'm, I'm a little okay. confused <laughs> on the names here. All right. Uh, Tamara Armstrong. Hold on one second, y'all. Hold on one second. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, my name is Tamara. I'm Sean from Charlotte, North Carolina. I am actually taking up digital cinematography, and yeah, two things that describe me is I'm outgoing and I'm always a student. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Maxwell Powell. Um, my name is Maxwell Powell. I'm from Grantsburg, Wisconsin. I'm studying game design. And two words that would describe me are determined and adventurous. Excellent. Great. Uh, let's see. Lucas Morgan. Hey, I'm uh, Lucas Morgan from Wailuya, Wisconsin, studying for the bachelor's in digital cinema photography. And two words that describe me would be creative and dedicated. Excellent. And uh, Travis Gabo. Uh, hi, my name is Travis Gibo. I'm from upstate New York. Um, I'm studying game design. Two words for me are innovative and inquisitive. Excellent. Well, uh, anybody I missed, raise your hand. If not, I think that was it. Uh, that's a good group. And amazingly, your names are easy to pronounce. Sometimes I have names that uh, really... Um, uh, make me make me guess hard, but uh, you guys have uh, uh, names within my my uh, ex realm of experience. All right, um, what do we expect from you guys? 
Well, we're not expecting you to be particularly um, proficient in anything yet. This is a month one class, but it is not a simple class. It's a class about your ideas. And so what we've tried very hard to do is make sure that the tech won't get in the way. That's not to say that there isn't any tech involved in this class. This is a creative pre presentation class. So what I want you all to do is to work at the level of technical polish that you already have. If you don't have any familiarity with any of the tools we show you, we're gonna give you some simple tools that you can start with. But those of you that already know certain aspects of this, uh, feel free to um, work at the level that you feel expresses who you are. By that I mean that if you're a creative present, if you're a, a digital video person and you wanna use video editing software to complete this assignment, you may. But I don't, anyone, I don't want anyone to feel like they've got to suddenly go start a brand new program that takes a long time to learn to do this assignment. I do not want you to let the tech get in your way at all. If you're an audio student and you wanna use high-end audio to do your audio recording, feel free to do so. If you've never recorded audio before, we're gonna show you some simple, easy techniques to do that. So we want everyone to re record audio and create multimedia in this class. And this is something that your generation does all the time. I mean, that's the definition of what Instagram and Facebook is. And so we're not really asking you to do things that you don't ordinarily do. We're just asking you to do it in the context of creating these assignments. But know that none of those multimedia technical skills are gonna be held against you or in your favor. What we're here to study are your ideas. So if you, if you uh, engage in each assignment and do the best and uh, follow, follow the directions that we ask you to do, um, you're gonna do well. Now, when I say follow the instructions, you're gonna find that a lot of the instructions um, have you inventing jobs for yourself. Uh, Full Sail is in, interested in a type of learning that we call problem-based learning. Meaning rather than just give you a recipe and asking you to copy that recipe completely so that you can mimic something, we wanna give you a map and ask you to go find your way 40, feet, 40 miles across the desert. We want you to solve problems for yourself. And we think that full cell students learn by doing. You guys are an active, creative bunch. And so we wanna give you assignments that are vague enough or have um, areas in them with creative freedom for you to choose so that your assignment isn't a cookie cutter assignment. You may actually create a problem for yourself that you don't know how to solve, which probably is more fun. Um, and our job as teachers is to guide you along. It's not to give you the answers. It's not to make sure that you're following a particular route. It's just help you around the problems. And for the most part, what you're going to find are that technical problems are the things that, that you run into this month. If you're trying to record your voice, if you're trying to add slides to a presentation, you know, how do you do that? Well, I can, I can solve those issues. And those aren't very important things to, to worry about. It's really about what are your ideas? What do you have to say? How well can you express yourself? And that's what we're looking for. So we expect you guys to engage. We expect you guys to be involved in the learning. Make the attempts. If I'm asking you to do something you don't know how to do, we'll figure out what it is you can do. But what I don't want you to ever do is stop and withdraw. Just keep at it. And if you don't understand something, ask. We're always here. So what we expect from students is that you let us know what's going on. As an online student, it's really pretty difficult uh, and kind of lonely. You know, nobody ever comes to your door and says, do you, all, you understand everything? You have to reach out and ask for help. Now we're gonna do as much as we can besides walking up to your door to see if you need help. I'm sometimes gonna call you guys out of the blue and again, I'm having a, a video office hours. So if you want to just stop, uh, come by and talk and tell me you're frustrated, 
we can work all this stuff out, but you've got to be proactive and getting ahead of me. And, uh, you know, if you don't like being really proactive with your teacher, uh, but you do need help, then I can direct you to other ex um, resources as well. We're going to have a lot of videos for you to watch. We're going to have reading for you to do. We have examples that we can, you can follow. There are going to be ways that uh, you can find the best information that works for you in, in figuring out how to solve your problems. So stay in touch with us. That's what we ask you from you. Now, what should you expect from me? Well, you should expect me to be generally available. Now, I'm not an ATM machine. I'm not going to be there every single moment that you look for me. Uh, I do have a life. But for the most part, I'm here for you. And uh, if you seek me, you should be able to find me pretty, pretty quickly. And if not, if you leave me a message, if you leave me an email, you're going to hear back from me relatively soon. Um, you will not uh, go days without hearing from me unless something dire has happened. Uh, and if you feel like you've waited a long time to hear from me, get a hold of me again, because maybe I just missed the message or something. But I want you to feel like your needs, your answers are being met. You should also uh, expect timely grading from me. Uh, all of the work that you do here, you know, from week to week, when you begin week two, it's important for you to know how well you did in week one so that you can go forward. And so uh, while the full sale policy is any work turned in on uh, a Sunday night has to be graded by the, 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 the Friday of the following week, uh, here at Creative Presentation, we have a much tighter standard. And we're going to have everything graded by Tuesday or Wednesday. And it's going to be my goal to try to have most of that important stuff graded for you on that Monday. So as soon as you've finished your project, you'll know how you did and you, you can have that information to move forward. So, um, you know, we're here for you. You should be able to expect that with no reason or no problem. Professionalism uh, is something that's a part of every grade or every class at Full Sail. It's a little bit hard to talk about, but you're going to experience it and it will become second nature to you. Essentially, here at Full Sail, we're not just trying to provide you with a skill and then you're going off on your own. We're trying to prepare you for a, a real job in the creative industry of your choice. And to do that, we have to turn you not just into somebody who knows some software, but into a working professional. And what does that mean? Well, a working professional shows up on time, stays till the job is done, uh, takes credit for his mistakes, uh, basically is responsible, treats his colleagues with respect. So it's an attitude. It's, it's becoming not only somebody who knows how to do some kind of software skill or technique, but to be a person that other people want to work with, that other people want to have around, that other people seek out. And you do that by making yourself a part of the team. Uh, and you treat your uh, cohorts with respect and you have an attitude of professionalism. And the way we instill it here at Full Sail is pretty much fake it till you make it. We're going to treat you as a working professional. Uh, the instructors are and your classmates are. We're all going to treat each other as the creative artists that we are. And we're going to be collegial. We are not going to slag people. And you're going to um, uh, meet your deadlines. You're going to make good on what you have to say and so forth. And so professionalism is an, a, a separate score that happens in every single class. It's 10% of your grade. And uh, at the beginning of the class, you have 100%. And if you do not do anything that detracts from your professionalism, then you end that grade with that 100% free 10% of your class. If you miss a deadline, if you are rude to someone, if you uh, say you're going to do something and don't, if you do anything that is less than professional, then those get noted on your record and ding, and they become uh, subtractions from your score. Now, this is not something that first month students ever really need to deal with. Most of you are so excited to be here at school, you're 
can't dream about misbehaving. But, you know, believe me, after you've here, been here for, you know, 20 or 30 months, people can get cranky, but you still have to get along with everyone. You still have to act in a professional manner. So um, professionalism is something, something you need to worry about, but it, it is something that we are going in the course of your degree program here to instill in you to make you the kind of working professional that people want to hire. And I think that's part of the secret sauce here at Full Sail. And uh, while it sounds corny, and at this point before you've ever experienced it, it, it's odd for me to talk about it. By the time you've gone through Full Sail here, you'll know what we're talking about and you will appreciate it. And you will, it is just the kind of thing that's gonna make other Full Sail grads wanna hire you and for you to wanna hire other Full Sail grads because you will have that secret sauce and know that it's sorely lacking in others out there. Um, so, reading. There are two books assigned for this class. They're written by the same person. Resonate and uh, Slideology. And there's a little bit of a story behind this. Um, Nancy Duarte, the author, is a creative art director. And like everybody else, she would just go to business meeting after business meeting in the 90s and early 2000s. And every time you go to a business meeting, uh, that meeting would get run by someone opening up PowerPoint and running through PowerPoint. And like so many bad meetings that all of us have experienced, the PowerPoints would be awful. Whatever the person was saying, that's what was on the screen. You know, that was the text that the, the person had to say, it, it, almost as if they were writing um, uh, um, cue cards for themselves. And, and why do people have to look at that? Uh, and if it wasn't text, it was like uh, little cartoon figures that didn't make any sense or told lots of bullet points and charts and graphs that almost sometimes weren't explained or anything like that. And so she was seeing an awful lot of bad PowerPoints and we all experienced it and we all just sort of said, thought, used to think, well, that's what PowerPoint is. But Nancy Duarte was an art director and she knew that she was in a meeting with a bunch of other art directors and that they were all creative. And she was wondering why people were turning off their creative to set through these dull PowerPoint meetings. So she wrote the book Slideology, thinking that people didn't really know how to make really good slides. And so Slideology is a kind of art graphic design book on what makes for a good slide. Uh, what, what kind of slide is useful in a presentation. And we're gonna talk a little bit about you know, that theory and whatnot. But uh, when she wrote Slideology, that was the first book she wrote. It was a huge hit and a lot of people uh, sought it out and they sought her out and they started asking more questions. And she almost immediately realized that while Slideology was a book that the world needed, she'd only told part of the story that she just talked about the slides. She hadn't talked about any of the rest of it. And that's the most important part. And that's what we're gonna learn this month. And so the next book that she wrote was Resonate. And that tells the rest of the story. And so if you wonder why PowerPoints are bad, there's a really simple reason for that. And it's that people use PowerPoint the software wrong. Um, if you think about it, if you got assigned to do a presentation and you said, oh, all right, I'll go do my presentation. You go to your computer, you open up PowerPoint and you turn it on. Now, what happens when you turn on PowerPoint? Uh, there's, a, um, there's a panel that comes up asking you to choose a theme. So you pick some background colors and some fonts and, and uh, uh, images and styles and whatnot. And once you selected that, it throws you into slide one. And so you're in this program and you're looking at slide one and slide one is staring at you and yelling, feed me. And all of a sudden you're starting to put stuff in there and you haven't really thought about all the particulars of the program yet. People make bad PowerPoints because they start with the slides and you should never 
ever, ever start with the slides. The slides are the last thing. The slides in a presentation are the visual enhancement. They are helping people to see and understand what the narrative is. But they don't create the narrative. They don't tell the story by themselves. They are always supplementing the voiceover. Whether you're a speaker or you're creating a voiceover for a presentation, it's that actual story. It's that human voice that's telling me what's going on that matters. And if you don't start with that, then your presentation is never going to make any sense. So that's the ring, that's the big secret here. People open up PowerPoint first when they should open it up last. You should never even start PowerPoint until you have finished completely your narrative. And, and ideally, you've even finished your audio. PowerPoint has the ability to create audio. And so if you want to do your audio within PowerPoint, you can. We're going to show you some other alternatives as well. Um, but the reason that PowerPoints ended up being bad is that they didn't think about a couple of key elements that have to be addressed before you ever start to make the presentation, before you start to put it together. And we're going to work on that process. We're going to figure out what is the true process of making a presentation. And if we can instill that in you this month, then you will have that as a skill going forward. And you will always be able to communicate in a better fashion because you're doing it properly. Uh, and I don't want anybody using their old lazy method of starting with the slides this month. I can tell when it happens. I can smell it. I, I know what those look like. And it just means that you're being lazy because I'm going to give you a better method, a better way to make PowerPoint slides. So the first thing you guys need to do is start to read some of uh, the Nancy Duarte. We're, we're assigning you five chapters this week. Eventually, we'll read these, this entire book and just a couple of chapters of the other book. But uh, I want you to read chapters one, uh, two, three, four, and seven this week. And uh, if we go to the um, class, so here is uh, here's the FSO system. And 1.2 is where we've assigned you these chapters. And you can get to them individually, or you can click here and get to the, uh, the book itself. But you'll notice that we're showing you these books on another website. It's called O'Reilly. We, we have a license with O'Reilly. O'Reilly is basically a, uh, a media arts bookstore or, or library. They, they have licensed over 100,000 books all on the creative arts. So on photography, cinematography, coding, uh, especially coding, um, but uh, audio production, uh, anything that you can think of that full sale studies, uh, O'Reilly has books on that subject. And so we've, uh, we've got a license with O'Reilly and they supply all the textbooks for all the classes here at Full Sail. And so your school credentials, your school email, your, your email name, address, and password are the credentials that you use to get into the O'Reilly bookstore. So I don't want you to ever go to O'Reilly itself on the internet. I want you always to take links through the FSO site. Because what that happens, when you click on this link and you want to go to chapter one, uh, of course, uh, O'Reilly's having a, uh, a brain fart right now. Um, a lot of times we're, okay, here, here we get through the book. All right, so when you click on a link and it goes to a page of the, chap, uh, of the book and so forth, what's happening there is your, your credentials are passing through the FSO system telling O'Reilly that you can, um, uh, that, that you're a member. And those block credentials are slightly different from the kind of credentials they give uh, individual members. If I were to go to O'Reilly website on my own and sign up and give them my credit card, they give me one kind of registration. But as a full sales student, you have another kind of registration. Why does that matter? Well, uh, 
it, it matters because the mobile app for O'Reilly doesn't work quite the way we wish it would. You really are going to have to read these books online from the website. Now you can do this on your phone, but you've got to use the browser on your phone. If you have a, a smartphone, you're gonna find that there's an O'Reilly app. And the advantage of the O'Reilly app is that you can download books from the website to your local phone and then you can read offline. And the books that we've assigned to you won't work that way. I wish they would, but uh, they don't. So you're going to have to read these books through a web interface and you're gonna to have to be online in order to be able to read them. So hopefully you'll do this in an area where you have Wi-Fi and not while you're using up any data on your phone. But uh, we have five chapters we want you to read this week. Why Resonate, Lessons from Smith, uh, Myths and Movies, Get to Know the Hero, Define the Journey, and Deliver Something They'll Always Remember, which is what we call star moments. So if you read these chapters, you'll get a really good sense of what Nancy Duarte believes presentations can do and why we should be intrigued by them. And if you cannot get through to um, O'Reilly Books, if, you're, if you click on these links and you're blocked somehow from going to the O'Reilly website, let me know or let tech support know. We need to fix that so that you're able to read these books. But uh, getting the reading done is very important. I suggest that be the first thing on your agenda. Uh, you don't have to read it all at once. It might take two or three days to get the reading done, but at least get started today or tomorrow on the reading so that you have the reading done by the uh, Thursday or so, and then you do not start the TED Talks until you've finished the reading. Basically, ha once you've done the reading, you will have a good perspective from which to address the TED Talks assignment. And so it's best to wait until you finish the reading before you start looking through the TED Talks. Um, going to next. All right. Um, I'm not running through this in a, uh, a media fashion, so I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, Nancy Duarte called the book Resonate because resonate, resonance is an audio term. And audio, in audio, resonance is when your audio, the sound waves leave your mouth and bounce out towards the world. And they hit surfaces and come back. So resonance is the impact that's made by hitting a surface. And that's what she wants your presentations to be. She wants your present your presentation is to be the impact that hits other people. She wants you to impact change. She wants you to create presentations that uh, make the world go round. In the modern world today, we no longer spend a lot of time in decision making. It's something we've got to do very fast. You know, 30 or 40 years ago, if there were a problem at a company, some vice president might get assigned the, the, the uh, a duty to study it. He'd study it for six months and he'd write what they call a white paper and it would get filed somewhere. And uh, you know, uh, in the age of boats turning very slowly, you know, you're talking about a decision that takes a year or two or three years to make. In the modern world, we have to make decisions very, very quickly. So that notion of studying something or or making a really definitive uh, report doesn't work anymore. What we need are short, quick meetings to get to the heart of things that let people know what are we dealing with right now? Don't bite up more than you can chew, just get to the straight heart of it and make a decision. And presentations are the way that we've discovered that we can clarify that. Presentations are meant to be short. You should never pad a presentation. The shorter the presentation, the better. You should be proud of a short presentation. It means that you've cut a lot of the fat out. Now, if, if people don't know what they need to know, your presentation is too short. But a good presentation is not an hour and a half or two hours. It is six minutes. It is 10 minutes. It is 20 minutes long. 
the shorter you can define all the elements and leave people in a situation in which they're ready to talk about or discuss the solutions, the better off you are. So we have defined the presentation as a way of telling a story very quickly and clarifying the elements so that we can get on and make a decision. That's uh, what happens in boardrooms and conference rooms all over the world. And whether you're uh, at a video game company trying to figure out what happens on the next level, or you're in an audio company trying to figure out what is the marketing plan for this artist, that's the way people set things up. They create a short presentation that talks about the issues, sets it up, and makes sure that everyone in that room knows that these are the things that we need to come to an agreement or a discussion about. So presentations can't be boring. They aren't meant to be a, a listing like reading the phone book. And that's what most people get trapped in. People make boring presentations and they're going through it as if it's an obligation. It's not an obligation, it's an opportunity. It's an important part of the chain of decision making that's going on. And when we, we're trapped in a boring presentation, what's happening is that no one is engaging us. No one is telling us really what's happening at all. They're just giving us a bunch of facts and figures. It's like they're reading the phone book. Facts alone don't make an engaging presentation. A good story is the basis of all presentations. So this is the main thing that you need to learn this month is that if you want people to believe and hear what you have to say and be excited about it, you have to take it from being a, a list of facts, a list of events, to being a story that makes sense. We are all natural born storytellers and there are thousands of ways to tell a story. So um, one of the things that we're wanting to work on this month is figuring out how to take the elements of whatever we have to say and turn it into a story that makes people want to listen, that makes people follow along, makes people engaged. So the important part is turning those facts and figures into a story and then supplementing that story with enough excitement, enough drama that people are gonna stay engaged. Why is storytelling more effective than simple reporting? Well, this is the way it's always been. We have learned for 100,000 years by gathering around the campfire and telling each other important stories. And sometimes the stories were very important. It's about our survival. You know, a hunter would go out and tell you, uh, this can kill you this way, this can kill you that way. And people would have to understand this is how it's going to be. And so, um, if you don't, grab the attention of the audience, they're not gonna remember it. We've actually done studies on this and it actually is part of human brain psych, uh, physiology. If you tell people a list of facts and figures, it goes into the brain and it gets stored in a couple of areas. But when people try to remember it back, they don't make the connections because they're stored in disparate areas and they haven't really made enough connections in their synapses to connect one piece of information with another. But if you tell someone that same information in a story with multimedia and drama and, and sound and video, then you've activated several areas of the brain. And when people try to recall that, they have the ability to remember that information much more vividly because more connections within the brain have been formed. So it's important to be able to tell people information with media with um, drama that helps them understand and associate with it. You need audio, you need video, you need pictures, you need color, you need uh, volume and contrast. These are things that are gonna register while people are listening to the story. Now, in order to tell a story, you just need three things. It's very basic, beginning, middle, and end. So a story is always, um, created by putting the facts in a particular order. The beginning is laying out what the issues are. The middle is talking about what the challenges are and, and, and addressing those challenges. And the end 
which we often call the takeaway, is setting the audience up for this is what we think you should choose, or these are the options for what you should choose. If, if, you're, if your group has to make a decision, put the decisions before them. If you're promoting a particular decision, then th that the end, the takeaway, is you um, uh, pushing for a certain outcome. So um, in order to have the visuals impact that the way we want, Nancy Duarte has defined a certain combination of quote and image that she thinks is the perfect slide to put that kind of point of view forward. Now, uh, anything that you put on a slide is valid and may work in particular context. So you could put a text or a quote all by itself. You could put an image all by itself. But Nancy Duarte has figured out that by combining an image and a quote together, you're creating more power and more specific intent as a creative artist. And let me show you what I mean. Here's a quote. And it's just a raw quote. It's Education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel by Socrates. So this is as basic a slide as you can get. It's a white screen, black text on it. Uh, the, the, the text is certainly readable, but there's no context for which to understand it. So if you look at this quote and think about it, there are a couple of interpretations of what we could be talking about. We could be talking about education for the ages, education as a, a general field. Um, are we talking about, you know, education of the moment or a, a, a contemporary feeling? Well, I'm not giving you any context for that. The only thing that I've done is told you who's, who created the quote, which is Socrates, who's somebody who lived 3,000 years ago. So that may make you tend to think that, oh, this is about education through the ages. But if I want you to have a particular opinion about this quote, I can combine it with an image that will focus your mind in a particular way. So that's my job as a creative artist. So I may be thinking about not education for the ages, but education right now, education as a, a modern social uh, construct. And I want you to think about education in the modern world today as the sense of urgency. So if I combine it with an image of third world kids in their un underpass teaching themselves, suddenly you think education is urgent and modern and of the moment. This is a current social issue. The combination of this photo and this text, I have made you think about this text in a particular way. What if that wasn't my intent? What if I wanted to choose something different? What if I did want to think about education through the ages? What if I did think it was important? that Socrates was the author. Well, I might choose a different image. I might choose a Renaissance painting of Socrates. And now you are thinking loftiness. You're thinking timelessness, education through the ages. It changes how you think about the quote. Now, hugely important in making your presentations have impact is knowing who your audience is. So, I know you guys don't care much about social issues or history. You care about pop culture. So how can I work pop culture into this? Well, uh, where does Socrates fit into popular culture? There really haven't been any great movies that have been made. Ah, but there was this pretty cool movie from the 90s with uh, Keanu Reeves in it called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure in which the character Socrates occurs. So if I take a clip from that movie, and put it in here, then maybe I've created a cultural moment between you and I. Now, this cultural moment only works if I know my audience. If I know that you guys know this movie and this becomes a, a, you know, a funny chuckle moment between us as I'm making this presentation, then I've connected with my audience. Now, I know most of you are 19 and, and maybe you don't even know who Keanu Reeves is. Well, you should know who Keanu Reeves is. He's made a comeback and he's in the John Wick movies and so forth. But is the Bill and Ted movies on your mind? You know, those movies were made in the 90s. You probably missed them. But then again, Netflix is back around. So I can never really tell. But uh, 
I have to know who my audience is. So part of my job as a creative artist is creating content specifically for the audience that I'm posing for. So if I knew you were all video gamers, I would probably choose video game art as context. If I knew you were into vi you know, movies or comedies or, or uh, you know, the 80s or 90s, I would choose content that riffed on that. It's knowing who my audience is and making those cultural context connections that is part of my job as a creative artist. And I'm coloring the way you think about this text. So those are parts of your job that's what makes this a creative act in making these presentations. And that's what's gonna make this so much fun for you this month. Not only are you making the presentation, but you're making the presentation based on your expectation of who that audience is and how they're gonna to react to that material. You know, you can, you can make the thing for yourself, do the presentation and then discover after the fact how people reacted. That's not a very good idea. But if you're a mindful artist and you know how to do some research and study your audience, you can know what will work and what won't work. And especially if you do it a lot and you gain a lot of uh, uh, experience from each time you do it again and again. But it's all pretty much about storytelling. Now we know that there's this theory of storytelling that your whole point is that as people listen to a story, you know, they're, they're the hero and they go on a journey. This is from uh, um, Joseph Campbell. I'm most, most of you have probably heard of this and got a storytelling theory in high school and so forth. All of this stuff's involved, but it goes beyond that. Um, you guys, if you think you're standing up and telling a long story to the audience, you think that makes you the hero, especially if even if you're talking about yourselves. But the way it really works is that you are the author and the audience is the reader and they're imagining going on this journey themselves. You are not successful as a storyteller unless the audience is sort of trying to run a movie in the back of their heads of the way of what you're telling them. So as you tell them the story, you want to make them and the hero of the adventure. You want them to think about this happening to themselves. You want them to have the motives. You want to use action words. You want to talk in vivid details so the audience can imagine this happening to them. If they go on that journey with, them, with you as you're speaking, then you have won the argument because they are going to experience these emotions. They're going to experience these choices in the, in the middle of the story. The options that have to be gained or overcome uh, are things that they will engage with and they will come to the conclusion that you lead them to. So uh, the audience is the hero. You're going to hear that from me. You're going to hear that from Nancy Duarte a lot this month, probably more than you want. But if it sinks in, you know, that's what we need to do. Uh, and so what is your job? If you're not the hero, well, there is in uh, storytelling theory, uh, a name for the person who takes the hero on his journey, who engages that hero in the learning process. And that is mentor. You are the mentor who's going to guide the audience through the adventure. Your words have to engage them into this journey. Even if you're telling them the story of your life, and uh, again, that's gonna happen this month. Uh, you guys are gonna talk a little bit about yourselves. But you're gonna tell it in a form that makes the audience imagine it happening to them. That's what great storytelling does. That's what's gonna make it powerful and dramatic. So as the mentor, your job is to engage the audience who are the hero. Your job is to get them to imagine these things happening for themselves. That's what you're all about. That's what good storytelling, that's what good, uh, creative presentations do. It takes us on the journey. And once we're on the journey, then uh, we no longer um, are outside ourselves. We're on the same wavelength as you and your, your, uh, your message. So this, is, uh, this, this notion of telling a story 
can be applied to any kind of subject you want to put forth. It doesn't have to do with, with uh, you know, hobbits and, and uh, uh, dragons or anything like that. It is something that you can apply to anything that you have to say. Any thing that you can communicate can be put in the form of a story that can be made more uh, entertaining and dramatic and memorable for your audience. So that's the reading that I want you to go through. I want you to make sure you read all of those chapters and you're going to gain that perspective that, that Nancy's putting forth. Uh, and then the two activities this week that I want to talk about. The first one is the presentation history. So if you come to your presentation history, you'll see that uh, on every page where there's an assignment, there's some downloads. And it's good to, to download these things. There's a fuller in, set of instructions that tell you about the assignment. And here, what we're asking you to do is just make a single post about yourself that tells us what your experience with presentations are. Have you ever made one? Did you have a good experience? Did you have a bad experience? Uh, what software did you use? What context did you have? A lot of people want to write and say, I've never given a presentation in my life. But we want to define this as broadly as we can. We are not really talking about PowerPoint here. We're not necessarily talking about school. Sometimes you might be uh, addressing a group in church or, or maybe teaching people in the army or, or, or doing a sales call. There are a number of chances that we have to deliver a presentation to tell a story to people. And if you widen your mind, you're going to think that these occurrences happen all the time. And so it doesn't have to be that you were running PowerPoint software or that you were in a kind of formal uh, audience you know, speaker situation. Anywhere that you're talking to at least one person and telling them a story counts. So I want you to talk about the experiences that you had. Uh, I want you to talk about your, your concerns about speaking out loud. One of the main things we're going to work on this month is using our voice as a communication tool and making it better, getting used to it, getting comfortable with it, and then finding ways to help us tell the story a little bit better. We're not going to push this. We're not going to you know, make anybody do anything that they're uncomfortable with. But we're going to start you on a path in which presentation by presentation, opportunity by opportunity, you're going to get a little bit better at communicating. And again, by the time you graduate, you're going to be natural at it. It's going to feel comfortable. You may think that you're not able, somebody who's able to talk to a lot of people, but you're going to find that it's something that you can do with practice and becomes second nature. So it really is just about making the effort. So in the initial post that we want here, we have a number of prompts that are questions that you might answer. Do you have to answer them? No. These are just ideas for what you might say. So what we want everyone to do is by Wednesday, write an initial post in the discussion board. So the initial post, you can write it here, or if you move on, you come down below the, the, the posting board, if you want to read what other people have written before you write anything, uh, you go to the discussion and you can see that some people have already written things. And if you post in the upper box, then the post becomes your initial post. Your name is attached to it uh, and it's fully flush left. When you read what someone else has written and you want to respond to it and you hit reply, then your post is a reply to that person. Your assignment this week is that everyone has to make an initial post and we would like you to do them all by Wednesday. Why by Wednesday? So that they're up and other people have a chance to read them because you all have, in addition to an obligation to make one initial post, you have an obligation in this assignment to make two or more replies. I hope you'll make more because this is how you're gonna engage with your classmates and get to know them all. But you need to have a chance to be able to read what they've written. So if someone doesn't write their initial post until, you know, uh, 9.30 at Sunday night, no one will have an opportunity to respond to it. So we're asking you to get that initial post out of the way by Wednesday. If you can't do it by Wednesday, it'll be okay. You can, you can post a day later or whatnot. But uh, 
we're trying to uh, set that up so that you get the initial post done by Wednesday, and then you have the end of the week, Sunday night, to get your replies in. And I'd like you to make substantial replies. This is a terrific reply. You know, it's easy enough to, to interject and say, hey, great reply, or great post. That's a nice thing to put, but that doesn't really count as something we're gonna grade. We want you to actually talk to these people. So basically, whatever they said, I want you to engage in them. If, you, if they're uh, interested in software and you have familiarity with that software, you might talk about that. If they had an experience that was similar to yours, then you might express that experience back to them. So we want you to engage with your classmates and really make this a useful discussion about what it is you want to get out of this class, what it is you have a fear of. If you have a fear of speaking, we can talk about it. Doesn't mean I'm going to allow you not to, have, to speak. Everyone in this class is going to have a, 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 an oral performance. Uh, that's just a given. And uh, you know, if 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 you think you're not, then get a hold of me because um, that is something that is the baseline of this class. Everyone is going to tell their story using their own voice. Uh, so the discussions are just a way to get to know other students, put your ideas out there start uh, networking with your classmates. The main assignment this week is what we're calling professional presentation analysis. So instead of making our own presentation this month, this week, we want you to see a bunch of others. Now, um, I can also, at this point, let's talk about the plan for not just this week, but the whole month. This week, we're getting an introduction to creative presentation. So you're reading those first few chapters of Nancy Duarte, finding out what it really means to do a great presentation. You're thinking about what it is, and you're going to see a whole bunch of great examples. That's what the TED Talk analysis uh, thing is. You're going to see lots of presentations that other people have done. For the rest of the month, you're going to be working on your own. So week two is about planning a presentation. Next week, I'm going to give you the topic of, of the, the, the presentation for the class, and we're going to start planning it. No one's going to make the presentation yet, but you're going to have a whole week, whole week to write down notes, to do some research, to think about avenues, to think up stuff. It's a brainstorming, put your thinking cap on, but don't make it yet week. Then week three, after you created that plan, you're going to execute that plan. Week three, we're gonna make a creative presentation. It's gonna have audio, it's gonna have slides, it's gonna have multimedia, it's gonna be a complete presentation. You're gonna turn it in, and then you're gonna get feedback from me, and week four, you're gonna have a chance to go back and make it even better based on ideas and feedback from me and other students. So uh, really, we're making one presentation, you get two chances at it, you have a, a first draft and a 2.0 version. But that's what we're doing all month. So this first week, the first thing, rather than working on our own presentation, is we're going to look at what other people have done and try to get a range in our head of the kinds of things that a presentations can do. So what we're doing is we're going to the TED Talks website. So uh, if you've never been there before, TED stands for Technology, Education, and Design. It's a company that runs conferences all over the world. And they invite interesting, creative people to do short presentations, Nancy Duarte type presentations. Uh, so instead of having one main speaker who might speak for 90 minutes or an hour, two hours, they hire 20 or 30 people in a two or three day span. And each one of them delivers short, interesting presentations between six and 20 minutes long. And, um, Every one of these presentations has been recorded and put on their website. So uh, we have now over 3,300 videos that you can watch, that you can see where these other, present, uh, other uh, speakers have um, done their best to do a creative presentation. And so what we're asking you to do in this assignment is to go to this website, the TED Talk website, there are 3,300 videos here, and you can access TED Talks in lots of places. You can access it on YouTube and uh, Apple TV and, and uh, lots of different places. 
but all of the presentations are here. So you can go through as many as you like. We want you to find, pick at least three. Now, my hope is that you are going to watch way more than three, that you're going to just, this is a great time to get lost down the rabbit hole. Every single one of these things is interesting. And some of them are going to be some of the most amazing things you ever saw in your life. And many of you have probably seen one or two. Uh, I'm hoping that you don't uh, go ahead and automatically pick a TED Talk you've already seen. This is a chance to see more and more and more. And whatever topic you're interested in, whether you're interested in filmmaking uh, or video game making, there are lots and lots of presentations about those. But I'm hoping that you make present that you just follow a presentation about something you've never even thought of, you know what vaccinating vampire bats can teach us about pandemics. You know, lots of really crazy topics. But if you pick a topic, the video is on the website. And I want you to write a review of the presentation. So watch as many as you like. I'm hoping that each one of you will watch at least 10. That, you know, that, that's a good afternoon spent. It'll only make you smarter and then pick the three that you like. So let's go and look at the instructions. The instructions are here. And if we look at the instructions, uh, presentation analysis, the assignment is research and watch a minimum of three different TED Talks to answer the question, what makes the presentation effective, captivating, and inspiring? Well, this is kind of fancy writing, but the, the baseline of what I want you to do is to write a two paragraph review of each of the three presentations. And what you're reviewing is not the content of the presentation, but you're reviewing the presenter. So if we come back here, here we see, this is Daniel Stryker and he's standing in front of some slides. Some of these have slides, some of these don't. Some of these have, um, you know, a person just standing there using their body language. Sometimes they have props. You never can tell. Um, but, and some of them are animated. If, if you find one that's animated and it doesn't have the speaker visible on the TED Talk, don't use that one. Because again, as I said, what we're doing here is we're reviewing the presenters. I don't want you to review the topic. You may have to tell me what the topic is. And absolutely, for every one of the three TED Talks that you pick, I want you to tell me the name of the presenter and what the name of the, the talk was. But beyond that, uh, you don't need to tell me everything he said about his subject. I need you to tell me how well he did as a presenter. You are reviewing the presenters. You're telling me how well they did their job. And the basis of comparison that you have for this is the Nancy Duarte reading. If you finish those five chapters in Nancy Duarte, then that knowledge from those five chapters should uh, give you a basis of comparison to say, this person did a good job, this person did a not so good a job, this person used this technique, that technique. What I want is for you to watch what the presenters do, see how they relate to their audience, see what techniques they use, and we're just gonna try to pick them apart and tell who did a good job or who didn't do a good job. So that's the assignment, it's a written assignment. And you'll notice that one of the things we did here in setting this up is we have some links here to your free access to Office 365. You guys have already been set up with Microsoft Outlook for your email. And that means that you have access to the Office 365 software by Microsoft. Now this is not something that, Microsoft, that, that, that Full Sail is doing for you. This is actually something that Microsoft does for all students. And it's really a terrific deal. If you're a college student and you have a college email address, then they're gonna give you a, a four year license to Microsoft Office 365. It's the latest software that they use. It's, it's the same thing that they sell. And they always give a four year license to students that have a legitimate school email. And you're able to download that software. You can use it online or you can use it on any device that you have. So the Office 365 software can be loaded onto Windows, 
It can be loaded on a Mac. It can be loaded onto an Android phone, or it can be loaded onto an iOS, iOS, either iPhone or iPad. So you're able to put this on any device you like. And another cool thing is part of the license that Microsoft gives you is that you can have it on two devices at once. So if you're using an old laptop right now, you can go ahead and put Microsoft Office 365 on it and use it for the next three or four months. And then when you get your launch box, you can put Office 365 on the Mac or the, the launch box uh, computer that they give you. So this is a really good deal and, and these links will help you to uh, set that up. Now, part of the, hick, uh, hit, uh, the trick with this is it goes off without a hitch if you've never used Microsoft before. If you've got a computer that you've already had a, a previously registered version of Microsoft on there, there's usually a problem and you might have to go to tech support and they can, tech support's really good at wiping out your old credentials and putting in the new. But if you have previously had a registration of Microsoft Office on the laptop that you're trying to set up, go ahead and call tech support because uh, this is not going to work instantaneously until you wipe out the old credentials. But uh, if not, then you can follow these instructions and it should easily put that on there. And with Office 365, you're getting a brand new copy of PowerPoint and you're going to a brand new copy of Word. And Word is the document uh, writing program that we want to use for this particular assignment. So here on uh, professional analysis, we want to write a paper and I want you to review three different TED Talks. Each review of each TED Talk should be at least two paragraphs long. You could be longer if you like, but I want it to be at least two paragraphs. You need to tell me the name of the presenter, the name of the talk, and I want you to tell me how well the presenter did his or her job. At the end, after you've done all three reviews, step three is, Conclude your assignment with your own list of 10 qualities, techniques, and or presentation skills that made the presentations you watched inspiring. Basically, you're writing three individual reviews about what that one person did. And then at the end, I want you to give me a list of 10 things that if you compare the three talks together, they share. What did these people do? Did they use humor? Did they use hand gestures? Did they ask questions? Did they, you know, whatever. You're gonna find that this list of 10 qualities is gonna come straight out of the reading from Nancy Duarte. So uh, if you do the reading, you're not gonna have trouble figuring out what some of these techniques are. Now, that's step three. I skipped step two. What's in step two? Create a document for this assignment and include supporting visual imagery. What does that mean? Add pictures to your text. I want you not only to have a written, sign, a written document, but I want you to add some pictures to this document. So that calls for examples. Let's look at some previous student work. So think of this in the way that you might think of magazine articles or something on the web. The text is the important part but the images help us understand the text a little bit better. So when I'm asking you to add images to your written uh, work, I'm asking you to help pick images that help us understand the topic better. So you've mentioned that the speaker is Amy Cuddy. Seeing Amy Cuddy is helpful. It is helpful to see a person uh, if you listed their name and so forth. Uh, if if the, some of the topics, you might have uh, images that will help us understand the topics better. So how many pictures should you have? Well, I don't have an answer for you on that. That's up to you. You can have one picture, you can have 100 pictures. But what I'm going to judge your pictures on is, are they relevant? Do they help me understand the text better? So if you just gave me a bunch of pretty pictures that didn't uh, apply to what you're writing, you know, that's not a good thing. But if the images help me understand what you've written better, then that is a good thing. And there's an obvious analogy here. This is the way a PowerPoint presentation is going to be run. The text is what your voiceover is. The text is you as the speaker telling me the story. 
and the visuals are the slides helping support the story with visuals. They don't tell the story by themselves, they just simply support it. And so you need to find images that help me understand the story better. And you can have as many or as few images as you like. The choice is yours. And you're gonna see a lot of examples that I'm showing you that go on really long. But remember, I said I want at least two paragraphs. If you give me two paragraphs per speaker, I'm happy, this is enough. So if you're worried that some of the examples I show you, students go overboard, well, that's just what full sales students do. If I ask you for 10 inches, you're gonna give me 25. Uh, I find that over and over and over again. If you're the kind of person that wants to do exactly what's being asked of them, you know, that's fine. You're also gonna get an average grade. But if you go over and above, then, uh, you know, that's always, uh, what we expect of full sale students. So if you only want to write two paragraphs, that's fine. Only write two paragraphs. You will have done what I asked. If you do less than that, your grade will suffer. If you do more than that, you'll, there's only so far above 100 you can get. Uh, but full sale students are always trying to um, best everyone that ever came before them. And that's why I get so many great examples. And I love to share these examples. So I am going to share the examples. Anybody that wants to see some of these examples, all you have to do is message me on the FSO system and I will share them with you. You can, you can text me as well. It's not as easy to share over text, but the easiest way for me to, to share it is uh, for you to go. Uh, you, notice that at the bottom of every single assignment page, there is a feedback box. This feedback box is a message just between you and me. Nobody else ever sees this. So if you want to write, I don't understand this assignment, or can I have uh, uh, some examples, that will come to me and I will be able to write you back directly. And the advantage is that in context, I know that you're talking about this particular assignment. So you can send me messages from a number of different ways, but if you send me feedback from a particular page, then I know that it's usually related to that particular assignment. But uh, anybody who asks me for samples, I will give them to you. Now, the rule with the samples is I'm happy to share. I'm happy to share as, as much as I can. What I'm not going to do is give everybody the same examples. And, and uh, when I share samples with you, the particular TED Talks that are mentioned are off limits to you. So while there are 3,300 top talks, if I give you a sample that includes Karen Thompson Walker, you can't use that one. Now, that's not much of a, 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 a deprivation. You've got 3,299 other TED Talks that you can use. But it also means that I'm not uh, taking her out of, con um, out of running for everybody. I'm sharing different samples with different people. So only the three examples that are used in the samples that you get can you not use. Uh, everybody else can can uh, uh, use whatever they like. But remember, it has to be a presenter. So you're gonna find a couple of TED Talks that are like all cartoons uh, and they don't have a visual, a visible presenter. Uh, don't use any of those TED Talks. So I should have a bunch of questions by now. I haven't seen much happening in the chat box, but um, anybody have any questions that uh, they have about the assignment at this point? Remember, this assignment isn't due until Sunday, so you have all week to work on it. If you have questions propping up, you can ask me questions throughout. But uh, we should have um, uh, plenty of time this week for everyone to get all of this stuff done. So uh, do we have any questions? Is everyone still hearing me? Did my audio go off? There we go. Do the instructions to apply include how to apply pictures to the Word documents? Well, that's a very good question. All right. Uh, let's go back to TED Talks. Now, I'm on a Mac, which makes it slightly different. Uh, 
On a PC, if you use the Chrome browser, you can get a lot of really easy, uh, great free extensions that do clipping. But let's say I wanna make a, a, a screenshot from this. On my Mac, I can just capture that area and it's there on my desktop for me to use. Now, if I open up Microsoft Word and just choose blank document, Uh, I have a page. I can, uh, you know, start it off as TED Talks. Bats, bats. bats. All right. If I want to insert an image into this, I want to go to the Insert Pictures from File. And I'll just get a requester, uh, make sure I go to my desktop, select the image, and it inserts there, and I have the ability to, to scale it around and so forth. Um, now, most of, this, most of the images you might choose to, to uh, illustrate this with might come from the videos themselves. You might do screen captures. You might be things that you pick off the TED Talk websites. Whatever images you choose, we want you to tell us basically the source of them. So if you go to Google Image, you could just do Google, you can say credit Google source. If you take them off the TED website, just say images from the TED web website. And uh, you can do it per image or you can just do a, a blank credit at the bottom, whatever is simplest. Uh, usually I don't expect you to do uh, a whole lot of images or a whole lot of credits. But if you take most of your images from TED Talks, Google Images, you could just do a single credit at the bottom, images from TED Talks or TED.com and Google search. And that's enough. Uh, the school has higher image citation uh, requirements for later classes, but this is, a, this is a, a week, a month one class, and we don't wanna put any heavy restraints on you. We just simply wanna acknowledge work that isn't ours whenever we use it in uh, a class. So inserting images into uh, Word is very easy. Inserting images into Google Docs is fairly easy. Uh, now there are a lot of different programs you can use. Um, when you save this, you either save it as a Word doc or PDF and it will preserve the imagery. Actually, here's the Word document. So um, if you do save as, your options are Word document or PDF. Either one of those is a great way to turn in your homework. And remember, we want you to have the name of the uh, the name of the speaker, the name of the TED Talk on each review. Uh, if, you, if you look at the examples, that'll, that'll make sure you get steered right. Uh, And again, if you're on a PC, uh, use the Chrome browser and the Chrome browser has extensions for screen captures. And that's a great way to uh, get images for your uh, TED Talks. Anybody else have any questions? All right, um, how many here are gonna try to do this on their phone? All right, well, one slight difference from the way that I'm working that I wanna just mention to you is that if you're using Microsoft Office on your phone, then you are necessarily going to be using the online version, meaning that the, word, the version of Microsoft Word that you're using is not local to the phone, but is actually on the internet. Now, why does that make a difference? Well, when you save that file, that file isn't on your phone. So when you want to turn in the file, you know, the way we're asking you to turn in your homework is as a completion box. And if there was a file here, you drop that file on the completion box and it uploads. So if you're on a Mac or a PC, you get an actual physical file, a Word doc, a PDF, and, and you would physically upload that from your computer to my, or to our system, and that's turning in your homework. 
But if you're on a phone and you're using the online version of the uh, software, then the completed assignment is going to be saved in the cloud. There is not a file on your phone that you can upload. So how do you share it? You share the document. There is a link from your uh, to your um, to the document you created on the cloud, and it should be in the sharing um, options. So if you're creating a physical file, you're going to upload the file to us. If you're creating something on the phone that lives in the cloud, you're sharing a link to us. And we can see the file on the, on the, uh, uh, the cloud and we're graded from there. It's not a problem at all. It's just a difference in the way you turn in the homework. So you would not be using this completion panel. You would just type in here, or you can actually make a, a short document or something that you drop in. But the easiest way is to uh, uh, just give me a feedback message saying, here's the share URL to look at my online file. Does that make sense? And sometimes people on phones have trouble doing things like making screenshots or inserting screenshots into Word docs. You know, if your phone doesn't handle that bit of multimedia, don't feel like you have to do that. All right, well, I've been talking quite a while. This is a lot. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, this is all being recorded, so this, the recording of this is going to be up uh, in a few minutes, and it'll be up all week for you guys to watch. So if, if you need to review it back, you can just come run through it. Do I have any more questions before I go? All right, well, um, it's been fun. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to have a little bit more slicker presentation of, of, of using Zoom uh, the more I use it. And uh, throughout the week, you're going to see in the announcements that I'm posting a time for um, uh, video office hours. Feel free to uh, jump in and talk to me then as well. So I'll see you through the week. Thanks a lot.